So far, we have discussed about three scheduling algorithms, namely the first come first serve scheduling, the shortest job first, and the priority scheduling. So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about the next scheduling algorithm, which is also a very important scheduling algorithm, and that is the round robin scheduling. So we will see what is this round robin scheduling and how it works. The round robin scheduling algorithm is designed especially for time sharing systems. So why is it designed for time sharing systems? We will understand that as we move ahead. And it is similar to the FCFS scheduling, but preemption is added to switch between processes. So this round robin scheduling algorithm in one way is similar to the first come first serve scheduling, but preemption is added to switch between the processes. And we will be seeing how it is done as we move ahead. So here, a small unit of time called a time quantum or a time slice is defined, which is generally from 10 to 100 milliseconds. So in this round robin scheduling, what happens is that we define a small unit of time, which is usually called the time quantum or a time slice. And this time quantum or time slice is generally defined from 10 to 100 milliseconds. So it will fall between 10 and 100 milliseconds. And what happens is that each processes will be assigned this time quantum for its execution. So whether the CPU burst of the process is greater than the time quantum or not does not matter, but this specific time quantum is assigned to each process. And a process will be allowed to execute only for that particular time quantum in the first round. And after that, the CPU will be given to the next process that is waiting in the queue. And that process also will be allowed to execute for that specific time quantum. And then the CPU will be given to the next process and so on. So what happens is the ready queue is treated as a circular queue and the CPU scheduler goes around the ready queue allocating the CPU to each process for a time interval of up to one time quantum. So that is what I just explained. So here what will happen is the ready queue where the processes are waiting is treated as a circular queue. So I have shown this using this diagram over here. So think of this as a circular queue. So this is the ready queue. And the processes are waiting in this circular queue, waiting for its turn to get the CPU for its execution. So here we are having 10 processes, processes P1, P2, P3 up to P10. So they are waiting in this queue. And when a new process comes, they will be added to the end of the queue or at the tail of the queue. So this is process P10, which is the last process. So if a new process arrives, it will be added after this P10 at the tail of the queue. So you may not be able to visualize the tail of the queue because it is circular over here, but actually it is not circular in shape. But just to make you understand, I have taken this diagram. It is actually just a normal queue where the CPU scheduler will move from one end of the queue to the other end and then come back to the start and again move from the start to the end and it goes on like that. So that is why we have depicted it using a circular queue. So we have processes P1 to P10 waiting in this circular ready queue waiting for getting the CPU for their execution. So what happens is there is a CPU scheduler that will assign the CPU to this particular processes. So first of all the CPU scheduler will come and assign the CPU to the first process that is there that is P1. So in this way it is going to start like a FCFS scheduling first come first serve. So whoever is first will be first given the CPU. And for how long will it be given the CPU? It will be given the CPU for a particular time quantum. So there will be a particular quantum of time that will be defined and only for that amount or that period of time the CPU will be assigned to a particular process. So let's say that the time quantum is 5 milliseconds. So what will happen is the CPU will be given to P1 for 5 milliseconds. So P1 gets a CPU and uses it for 5 milliseconds, that is one time quantum. So after that, the CPU scheduler will come and give the CPU to P2, which is the next process that is waiting in this regular queue. So P2 will get the CPU and will also be allowed to execute for 5 milliseconds, which is a particular quantum of time. And after that, P3 will be given the CPU and will be allowed to execute for 5 milliseconds and so on. So it will go around like this in the circular queue and when it reaches the end of the queue, what will happen is that it will again come and check if P1 has completed its execution or not. So if P1 has completed its execution, then P1 does not have to get the CPU again. But if P1 did not complete its execution in the first quantum of time that it has received, 
then the CPU will again be given to P1 and it will again be allowed to execute for one quantum of time which is 5 milliseconds in this example that we are talking about and then it will go on like that for the other processes as well. So that is what happens in a round robin scheduling. Now we will see how this round robin scheduling is implemented. So if you understood the above example that I have taken, it is very easy to understand the implementation of round robin scheduling. So let's see how it is implemented. So what happens is we keep the ready queue as a first in first out queue of processes. So we are keeping the ready queue as a FIFO queue as shown here. So I have shown you a circular queue in the previous diagram. So actually what it is, it is just a first in first out queue. So where we have a head of the queue and we have the tail of the queue. And new processes are added to the tail of the ready queue. So whenever a new process arrives, the process will be added to the tail of the queue. Then what happens is the CPU scheduler picks the first process from the ready queue, sets a timer to interrupt after one time quantum and dispatches the process. So after this what happens is the CPU scheduler will pick the first process that is at the head of the queue and it will set a timer to interrupt after one time quantum. So as I already explained the time quantum is a particular period of time that will be defined. So for different cases we may have different quantum of times. So sometimes it may be 3 milliseconds or 4 milliseconds or 50 milliseconds and so on. So we will define a time quantum and then once the CPU scheduler assigns the CPU to the first process that is there at the head of the queue, at that moment a timer will be set and a timer will be running and then the timer will run for that one time quantum. So let's say if it was 5 milliseconds it will be running for 5 milliseconds. So at the 5th millisecond the timer goes off and at that time the CPU scheduler will take control of the CPU away from this process that was using the CPU and it will give it to the next process that was waiting in the ready queue and it goes on like that even this process will use it for that particular time quantum then it will be given to the next process and so on. So once it reaches the tail of the queue what will happen is the CPU scheduler will again come back to the first process and see if it has completed its execution or not and if it has not completed its execution it will give the control of the CPU to this first process again and can again execute for one time quantum and then it will go on like that. So we see that it is going in a circular fashion. So that is why I have shown you a circular queue in the previous diagram. Alright so this is what happens. Now when the CPU scheduler picks the first process from the ready queue sets a timer to interrupt after one time quantum and dispatches the process. So after this what will happen? So there are two cases that can occur after this. So let us see what are those two cases. So here are the two things that can happen. So the first case is when the process gets the CPU, the process may have a CPU burst of less than one time quantum. So it means here is that we are having a time quantum which is a particular period of time as I already told you and the CPU burst of the process may be less than the time quantum. So let's say that the time quantum that we have defined is 5 milliseconds but the burst time is only 3 milliseconds. So then what happens? The process itself will release the CPU voluntarily because the process itself is having only 3 milliseconds of burst time but the time quantum that is assigned to it is 5 milliseconds. So it does not have to use the CPU for 5 milliseconds. So after using it for 3 milliseconds that process can release the CPU and it will do so voluntarily. So that is what we are talking about here. So when the CPU is released voluntarily by that process what will happen? The CPU scheduler will then proceed to the next process in the ready queue. So when the CPU is released by that process that was using the CPU, the CPU scheduler will then give the CPU to the next process waiting in the ready queue. So this is one thing that can happen. This is the case when the CPU burst of the process is less than one time quantum. So that is what happens. Now what is the next case that we have? So the next case that we have is the CPU burst of the currently running process is longer than one time quantum. So if the CPU burst of the process is longer than one time quantum then what happens? So for example if the time quantum that we have defined is 5 milliseconds but let's say that the burst time of the process is 10 milliseconds then what will happen? At the 5th millisecond the timer will go off and will cause an interrupt to the operating system. So when one time quantum period has completed the timer will go off 
and it will cause an interrupt to the operating system. Then what happens after that? A context switch will be executed and the process will be put at the tail of the ready queue. So that is what actually happens. So let's say that this is the process that we are talking about. It was at the head of the queue and it got the CPU for its execution and it was executing. Now the burst time of this process is actually greater than the time quantum that we have. So we are assuming that it is having a time quantum of 10 milliseconds. So if the time quantum is only 5 milliseconds, so it will execute for the first 5 milliseconds and after that the timer goes off. Then what happens? It did not actually complete its execution. There are more 5 milliseconds remaining. So what will happen? This process will be taken from here and it will be put at the tail of the ready queue. It comes from here to here. It will come at the tail of the ready queue. So that is what will happen. And then the CPU scheduler will then select the next process in the ready queue. So what will become the next process? This will be the next process now because this has gone to the tail. So this is the next process and this will begin its execution. So remember that when a process has not completed its execution and when the CPU is taken away from it, there is a context switch happening and at that time the current context of that process has to be saved because we know that this process did not complete its execution. So we have to save the current state of that process because when the CPU will be given to that process again later on, we should know from where it has to continue its execution. So the context or the state of that process has to be saved. So that is also done in this case. So this is what will happen in the case where the burst time of the currently running process is longer than the time quantum. So if you see clearly here from what I have explained, we can understand that it is not actually the CPU scheduler that is going round and round making a circle, but the CPU scheduler is here always picking the process at the head of the queue. So what happens is when a process did not complete its execution but has exceeded one time quantum, it is taken from the head of the queue and put at the tail. Then it continues in the straight way again. So the CPU scheduler will always pick what is at the head of the queue. So when this is put from the head to the tail, this becomes a new head and the CPU scheduler will pick that process. So that is how it actually works. So this is a very important scheduling algorithm and it is mostly used for time sharing systems. So as we see, the time is shared between the processes that we are having. So here we have to be also very careful about choosing the time quantum. If we are choosing a very big time quantum, there may be some disadvantages. And if we are choosing a very small time quantum, there will be too many context switches that will happen. So we have to strike a balance between these two to make this algorithm work in an efficient way. So if we are choosing a very large time quantum, then this round robin scheduling algorithm will become like a first come first serve scheduling algorithm. Like for example, let's say that we have a time quantum of 50 milliseconds and then the process that is at the head of the queue is having a burst time of 40 milliseconds. And then the other processes that are waiting in queue are having smaller burst times of let's say 3, 4, 5 milliseconds and so on. So what will happen? The scheduler will pick the first process that is at the head of the queue and it will be assigned the CPU and the time quantum that we have assumed here is 50 milliseconds and the burst time of this process that we have assumed is 40 milliseconds. So this process will be executing for that 40 milliseconds completely because the time quantum is anyway larger than that. So for that 40 milliseconds, these processes will be keep on waiting for this process to release the CPU. So it is becoming like a first come first serve scheduling. And again, these processes are starving for a long time for the CPU. So if we are having a large time quantum, that is what will happen. And also if we are having a very small time quantum, what will happen? There will be too many context switches. That is, let's say that the time quantum is only one millisecond. And if this process is having a burst time of five milliseconds, we see that it will first get the CPU and it will be executed only for one millisecond. Then it will be switched. Then the next one will get and so on. So we see that this process that is having five milliseconds of burst time has to be switched a minimum of four times. So there are so many number of context switches happening. So that is also not a very good thing for an efficient algorithm. So we have to strike a balance between the two. So that is how the round robin scheduling algorithm is implemented and that is how it works. So in the next lecture, we'll be discussing about how to calculate the average waiting times and the average turnaround times for a round robin scheduling and we'll also see the factors on which these things depend. So it is a bit different from the other scheduling algorithms that we have discussed so far 
so we will be taking it up as a different lecture so i hope this was clear to you thank you for watching and see you in the next one